Okay, we're live. All right, so this is the next APPM Hangout. I'm going to press the keys on social media to let everybody know that we're starting. Um, APPM is Associated Press Photo Managers. We're a group for photo editors, photo managers, photographers, students, and educators to talk about issues um, about and other relevant topics and bond over uh, the decisions we make in photo editing. Um, so thanks so much for joining us tonight. For those of you who are catching us later, you can find us on our YouTube channel or the Hangouts page on our website, which is apphotomanager.com. And so you can look up, and this will be archived there. Feel free to share it. It's kind of like a podcast you can listen to um, uh, when you're doing your photo editing at night, right? So um, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, just a couple of quick uh, announcements is one, if you're not a member of APPM, we'd love to have you join for the very reasonable price of $30, right? So it's not too bad. <laughs> and it helps us put on things like this as well as our annual conference, which is coming up September 11th through 14th in Philadelphia. Um, it is in cooperation and collaboration with APME and ASNE, and we have a really exciting lineup of speakers who are going to be joining us. Brian Casella from the Chicago Tribune, James Estrin from the New York Times, uh, Denise Keenan and Danny Gowalski, um, just some really great photo editors out there talking about everything from interactive storytelling to projects to um, working on personal projects um, and grants while on staff in a newspaper. Um, so we hope that you take the time to join us um, in Philadelphia, September 11th. And if you come to APPM stuff, you can also choose to go to APME and ASNE stuff as well. So it's come one and see it all kind of thing. Um, but it should be a great time. We're really excited to kick that off. Um, so with us today, we are talking about um, editing in a time of overwhelming hard news. Right, and all of the exhaustion and decisions that come with that. Um, going along with the topic, we have some photo editors who will be jumping in as they go, um, who are caught up in making decisions about what's running and news. So Nick Kirkpatrick will be joining us from the Washington Post um, at some point during this conversation. Um, we were sorry to have John Balance at the Advocate in Baton Rouge not be able to join us tonight for obvious reasons. If you don't know about the flooding there, um, uh, please go learn more, you know, um, and we hope that all is going well for John, his family, his friends, his colleagues, um, in this really hard time down in Baton Rouge. Um, for the two people we have with us tonight, we have Sue Morrow from the Sacramento Bee. Hi, Sue. Hi. And then we have Pat Trailer from the Denver Post. Howdy. And Pat is also APPM's president this coming oh, year. Yay. 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 Yes. So uh, usually I kind of help moderate these things, but I can jump in here and uh, get the discussion moving along as well. Yep. So Pat's going to be helping out. Um, I'm Becky. <laughs> I uh, uh, teach at Ohio University. Um, and so we're really excited to get this conversation started today. Um, so Sue, I guess we'll just kind of kick things off with you. Do you want to give us a bit of an idea of your background, um, especially sure. when it comes to this kind of topic and thinking about breaking news, hard news coverage, and yeah. what your experience has been with that? Yeah. I'm the Assistant Director of Multimedia at the Sacramento Bee. I've been here at the Bee for about 11 years. Um, I've been a photo editor for about 30 years and covered all kinds of news events from international, having staffers send in um, their own work from international, uh, whether it be conflict of Iraq or uh, the Russian coup back in 91 or 2 to Persian Gulf War um, and now I'm dealing mostly because we don't send staff on big trips to conflict zones anymore. Mostly I deal with um, the pictures that we're going to talk about today through, via wire services. Um, just FYI, oh, we only get the wire feed for AP now and the New York Times. Uh, so I don't, I can see Getty, but if we really, really, really want to get something from Getty, it's, you know, we've got to work out the purchasing of those. So um, my, my scope of photographs to choose from, I'm not seeing Reuters, I'm not really seeing Getty unless I really actively go after that feed, and uh, we want to put money out for that. So that's a little bit of kind of perspective at Sacramento Bee right now. 
do you mind if I ask? Is that like budgeting reasons to? Yeah. Do, okay. We did have Getty. Um, it's it's unfortunate, but yeah, it got cut from the budget, and we do hope that it's restored over the next year or so. But um, I, we feel it. I do. <laughs> it's just the more you can have to complete a visual report, the better. And um, the Getty services are, are phenomenal when it comes to that. So, um, but we use, you know, I'm a big believer in you work with what you've got. So we do. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm Pat Trailer at the Denver Post. Um, we, I'm in sort of the same situation uh, with using wire photos. I'm, I'm kind of the daily uh, news photo editor uh, now, so I work primarily with our, our own staff uh, photographers, um, and then uh, same kind of thing. We really don't send people out uh, really outside the state very much, uh, and certainly not for conflict zones uh, or, you know, these big news events, even nationally uh, anymore. Uh, I think during Katrina, we, Hurricane Katrina, we sent a photographer uh, down there, um, the f current flooding, we definitely don't have a photographer there. So we're, depending on wire services, we have AP and Getty available to us. We used to have Ro also Reuters and the New York Times. Now we don't, aren't able to subscribe to either of those. So, uh, but we do have AP and Getty. Um, so that's our limited scope. Um, the New York Times has lots of cool stuff we wish we could use. Oh, and actually, we also get Washington Post um, syndication service, so that's that's another uh, place we get pictures from. But um, hopefully, we I used to. It was great having New York Times and Reuters also, and for a little while we had European Photo Press Agency, which was pretty cool. But um, you know, we we also make make do with what we have and make the most of what we have. Yeah, and let me just add, um, a lot of papers, you know, we work together. Uh, today I just called the LA Times because I went through their gallery, their fire gallery, and it's like, mm -hmm. oh my god, can you please send me number one and number three? <laughs> and yeah. boom, you know, they're great. We help each other out a lot, and I find that that's to be true most everywhere around the country. And, you know, we're talking about hard to look at or hard to run pictures. I'm not talking just about international stuff, as we all know. So I, I felt like I needed to acknowledge that too. But even even still, our staff is really not sent out um, out of the state very much. Um, we did, like uh, Katrina, like you mentioned, Pat, we did send three people to Katrina when I first got here. I was here a week when that happened. and. Um, yeah, we're not doing that much anymore. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of national and sometimes local stuff that's hard to deal with, too. So there's that. So are you all relying on those wires that you do subscribe to and contacting the papers that are immediately involved? Is that how you go about it? You know, if you really, it depends on the situation. Um, it just depends on what the story is. Uh, if there's a Sacramento connection, I'll pick up the phone or find an email. You know, Facebook, <laughs> you know, hey, can you help me out? Um, oh, my gosh. It was, it was a, somebody from, um, oh, Jason Reed. Oh, my God. He just helped me. He attended Kalish a few years ago, and I needed something from Reuters that was Sacramento-related. And I couldn't raise anybody. It was after hours there, and he, he totally responded. So it's like, use your resources when... When you've got you've got so much now at, the, at your fingertips, and he was like, "Sure, yeah, let me help you out." And we dealt with the cost later on, and it was, you know, people will help you. You just have to ask, and it's uh, it's a good deal. You just have to time it right and figure out what to say. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, people are busy, so just be mindful of the situation and if you really should make a direct call or not. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we do the same kind of thing. I mean, definitely with our some other of the local papers in the state, in the, the Colorado Springs Gazette or um, Boulder Daily Camera here in, in Colorado, we, you know, send each other messages all the time. Hey, are you doing this? Are you doing that? Can we 
you know, get your photos from that, or can you just move those on the wire, and they'll help us out there. But even across the country, you know, just find a find the contact us page on the newspaper's website and call mm-hmm. up, try and get somebody in photo, and usually uh, um, they're more than happy to send us a photo of of whatever you know we're looking for. Um, if that's something we can't find on the wire, obviously the wire is the easiest place to find things. But um, and in breaking news situations, usually the the wire is gonna yeah. gonna have everything. But usually that would be for you know kind of feature stories or you know something that's not immediately breaking news. But I uh, you know when people reach out to us for photos, I you know if it's another newspaper, I send them two or three photos immediately and just just get it over to them because I know I'm always in the same situation. Yeah, so how has that changed your all's workflow? Like, did you used to go to the wires only, first and foremost, and now you have to spend more time figuring out how to be resourceful? Or how has that changed? Like, let's say there's something um, uh, going on right now. We'll tell, say Baton Rouge or something like that. Has it changed your workflow and how you're looking at sourcing images and figuring out space for photos um, in terms of how you're going about sourcing them from other publications and wires? Um, I go straight to the wires first. Let's we can use Baton Rouge for a good example. Um, I, I go straight to what we have at our fingertips first, and um, if by chance there was a, a local connection, which there hasn't been so far, um, you know, I would I would try to figure out the best and the easiest way for somebody to help me out on that end and not expect a whole lot considering what they're dealing with. Um, and you know, it's I do keep an eye on social media to see if anything is out there that I haven't seen run on AP or the New York Times. And honestly, for print, it's, um, it's really touch and go. Our deadlines are so much earlier, even on the West Coast. You know, West Coast deadlines are <laughs> kind of blessed out here, right? <laughs> but our deadlines yeah. moved out quite 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 a bit. So you can't really wait around for some other stuff to move much longer. Um, and our space is so limited that uh, the time that I spend is like, OK, can we build a gallery with this? Or what else can we do online with it? And it's, it's really not so much about print anymore. I've let go of a lot about print until that the really tough images uh, like the little boy that was found on the beach. It's like, now nah, we got to talk about this, and it needs to go in front. And it needs to go online, and how are we going to do that? So that still takes place, without question. Gotcha. So, so can you walk us a little bit through how that conversation happens in your newsroom? Sure. Oh, we have Nick. Oh, hello. Yay. Hi. Hi, Nick. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Okay, great. Sure. So everybody, this is Nick Kirkpatrick from the Washington Post. Uh, jumping on. No, it's okay, Nick. When I was introducing you before you uh, were able to join us, I was mentioning, hey, this is part of covering news. Is that you know we have to go with the flow. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, you mind giving us a little bit of information about uh, where you work and uh, we were just talking about daily workflow of how we source images, actually. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm the foreign photo editor uh, at the Washington Post. Um, I started in 2010 as an intern, uh, and then uh, later uh, I was a freelancer and contractor uh, before joining the overnight team uh, in 2014. Uh, and I've been at my current position for about 10, 10 months now. Okay. And where are you yeah. sourcing images from? I know Sue and Pat were telling us that their wire services have decreased and that they're having to become more resourceful in terms of um, calling colleagues and things like that when they really need something, um, but that we go to wires first tend to. How do you go about sourcing your images on the foreign side? Well, you know, I think I think it depends on the story. Um, I, I think when, when I worked overnight, which I worked for a blog called The Morning Mix, which was uh, a lot of what we did was try to bring uh, as kind of newsy and uh, kind of... Um, uh, viral stories uh, fresh for the morning uh, readers. So a, lo- a lot of those stories I couldn't even depend on wires for because it was before most of the U.S. had 
woken up. And um, so my first go-to is sort of social media and to try to source and verify those images, which you know, are very difficult to, to do. But uh, in foreign now, uh, I'd say I heavily depend on the wires. Uh, but, you know, I, I think we need to push ourselves to be as creative as possible to find uh, images that best represent the story, even if it's not from the lawyers. Sure. Um, so uh, just to jump back to where we were is we kind of got on the topic of how are the conversations happening when we're dealing with difficult imagery, especially in this time of um, online um, it's possibly coming way, way, way before we have print conversations and things like that. So, um, Sue, you were about ready to jump into just to um, get back to what you were thinking of how those conversations happen in your newsroom. Yeah, um, the one that just pops into my head is the, the little boy, the little infant on the beach. Is that about a year ago? Mm -hmm. um, in Greece, and uh, it was a refugee story. Um, you know, that just totally went viral. Everybody was seeing it. And the fact that, you know, pictures are just out there for everyone to see quicker than we can ever publish, of course. I think that that's kind of helped the conversations quite a bit. And it's also changed them in some ways. Um, but I do remember that, OK, is this going to go in print? Because there is still something about that printed piece of paper that is feels more like permanence in a way that how do you use it, how do you, what size, where does it go, um, that conversation must still take place and so that day I do remember bringing the editors over to the photo editing booth and we sat there, there must have been six people gathered around looking at a, a selection of photographs that I I'd taken off the wires and just like clicking through and saying, okay, this is this is the one. And everybody agreed with that and went from there. The decision making went from there. And everybody it's a very respectful process in, in this newsroom and it's it's I don't it's not argumentative at all. It's more um, okay what do we know? What do we don't know? There's so many questions that you have to answer. You know, who are your stakeholders? Um, it, it's all about that. It's the scope of the story, uh, where the story comes from. But we all felt that that picture had to run. And um, I don't, I wish I could remember how we did it. I might just look it up here while, while we're talking. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Picker Pat, does it happen similarly where you all are at yeah. Denver and Washington? Yeah, definitely. There's always a. I, I think kind of our our we generally have a policy in place that we you know normally don't run uh, graphic dead body photos. Um, we're not you know we are. It's just not something I guess. I don't know. Our readers expect to see every day. However. Um, you know, when there is a, a example of a photo like, like that photo or something that w as photo editors we feel is needs to be the image um, that day and we feel we have a strong case for, for why it should be out there, we always, um, you know, uh, bring that up the line and uh, have, have a lot of really good discussions about it and sometimes um, and it's, I wouldn't say it's really like us fighting or, or win, trying to win or lose, but just um, the result of that conversation sometimes leads to us publishing that photo, and sometimes it doesn't. So, um, but yeah, it's always a very respectful, um, uh, in-depth conversation about that picture and, and why, why we need to run it, you know, because um, we're not a national publication, but we do have a... Uh, you know, nation world section every day. Um, so there's always that discussion, and it's uh, that's always a, a very good discussion when we have it. Nick, how about you? Um, is there a difference between the non non sensitive imagery versus the sensitive imagery in terms of how your newsroom discusses what's running? 
Well, definitely. I, and I think the most important question, or one of the first questions we ask, is exactly where is it going to go, and in what context is it going to run? Yeah. Um, you know, if, if is it going to run behind a graphic warning? Is it going to run uh, on an inside page, or will it run on the front page, um, or will it be the sort of featured shared image that Facebook then embeds? Um, so that's sort of the first thing that we we ask, uh, and then more importantly, we ask, you know, does it move the story forward? Is it important to have this image to tell the story? Or are we, uh, A, violating someone's privacy? Um, are we disrespecting the people that are in the picture, whether they're alive or dead? Um, there are a lot of things that happen. And uh, I think as photo editors, we, we're very desensitized <laughs> to seeing these sorts of images. And uh, you know, I, I, I see these images every day of dead bodies and of children like, uh, in Aleppo. Currently, um, and so a lot of what we do is we'll we'll show other people in the newsroom and other people and ask them how they react to it, uh, and mm -hmm. you know all of that decision comes down uh, eventually comes down to our, our managing editor, but um, it's a it's a discussion and a, and something we take very seriously. Mm -hmm. No, it's good to hear from all of you because I know. Um, I'm sure you all hear it too on social media and things like that. The idea of our our media organizations trying to sensationalize stories based on what we're showing, and I always find that's a really difficult conversation to have with people who aren't as used to um, seeing these images that we're seeing. And and we hear it about everything, right? We hear it from difficult fire photos to the violence going on in Syria, um, and what we're seeing there. Have you all approached that kind of conversation, knowing that? Um, the general viewer isn't seeing the inundation of images that we are seeing, right? Um, and so they're having a reaction to it. Do you all approach those in different ways individually or in your newsroom? Hmm. Um, uh, yeah, um, I think that words are so important to go with these pictures. I think that we have to be very mindful. You know, sometimes an editor's note um, and often we've had two or three columns, Sunday columns in our editorial section um, on a Sunday written by our executive editor that talks about why we make the decisions we make with some visuals. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we are, when we disclose how we, the process, and when we um, are very open about why we make such choices, we hear from few people. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking like two or three emails or calls. Mm -hmm. And then I'm prepared to take calls. I'm like, send them my way. I want to talk to those people. I enjoy talking to those people. And um, I, it's not that I want to convert them, but I want to hear from them. And we end up usually, I've never had, a, you know, we don't have to agree. But I really am interested in hearing what how people respond to pictures emo on an emotional and intellectual level. I think it's really important to do that, and they're usually surprised. <laughs> they can have a conversation about it, but um, you know that happens. But it's I think it's a fascinating process. Um, anyway, I don't want to keep going on, but. No, Pat or Nick, do either of you handle that differently in your places? Is it somebody else who fields comments like that? Um, no, we'll yeah, we field comments. We'll get if it's a um, a question specifically specifically about photos, uh, the photo choice in the paper. We'll field those, um, or you know, or I'll I'll pass it up to my boss, <laughs> our director mm -hmm. of photography, who can can field those, but it kind of just depends on the photo and uh, who uh, who chose to run it. So I'm I'm pretty recent in my current job. I was handling sports mainly before um, uh, just like a, about a month or two ago. So I haven't I haven't um, taken too many of those calls yet. I did take one about how we yeah why we didn't run a, the Broncos Super Bowl ring handout photo, but that was less of a <laughs> uh, intense situation. But. Yeah. 
Well, how do you all handle, how are, um, as photo editors, making these decisions, and especially with how rapid we have to work online, right? Some of these stories that we're covering have been going on for years at this point, some of them. Um, how are you all handling those decisions in your place of work in terms of, or as yourself, as you're looking at images and photos and thinking about the balance of coverage? So we could talk about um, Syria, for example, or the refugee crisis, right? We've been seeing those images for a long time now. Is, is, has anything changed in terms of how you're balancing the uh, graphic coverage or the visual coverage of these types of things that we're seeing uh, many times over? Nick, this is probably a great one for you. Well, so uh, one thing that we that we've kind of implemented recently at, at the post is um, our assignment editors, like myself, are embedded within our section. So I sit with all of the foreign um, editors uh, and our politics people, so politics people, um, and you know I I really think that that helps inform uh, all of the decisions I make uh, based on doing the same covering the same sort of stories over and over and over again, so I, I can sort of tell what's fresh and what's not. And um, I think I definitely uh, consider the previous coverage that we've had and in, in, in what we choose and trying not to run the same imagery over and over and over again um, and trying to keep it fresh and to engage readers in a way that um, might bring them into the story in a different way than we did before. Yeah. Yeah, I think when it comes to covering these long-running uh, stories, I, I used to do more of the wire, just like wire photos specifically for a while before I moved into sports. So I'm kind of coming back around to that. And, you know, I think I would always look for, you know, what's new about the story that day, you know, uh, if it's, you know, so a big bombing happened, um, if we're talking about Syria, if there was a big, big assault or, you know, uh, look for visceral reaction uh, to that, or if we're, if we're now talking about the refugee crisis, look for something that gets, gets at the, the lack of hope or, or the real emotional despair to that situation without being a cliche, but it's just every day that that's even though it's the same story, uh, you know, same running conflicts every day. It's there's a new element to it every day. There's a new twist, and uh, and I think you can always find find a photo that speaks to what that is that day, and and something that's not repeating the same photos you've you've run over and over before. There's always some new element you can find, something new you can be looking for. And it's, you know, not always super easy to find that, but I think we are, that's what we always try for. Mm -hmm. Are you all looking at other publications in terms of thinking about how to balance, um, I mean, so much of what we see is online now. I see, I see visuals from papers that would never be something um, in my local sphere of subscription, right? Um, are you all looking at how other publications are covering things in terms of making these decisions too? Uh, oh, sure, absolutely. But, you know, I'm going to... Sacramento has become so local and regional that a lot of the national, international coverage is, like, minimal in print. I'm just talking about print. And even on our website, unless there's big news, there's not going to be somebody taking the time to build gallery from news pictures, although it does happen quite a bit. Um, I am the daily photo editor. It's me and my boss, so a little bit of perspective about how much time we have in the day right now. Um, it just really it depends on what the story is. So if it's a big breaking news story, no matter where it is, I will dump pictures in Photo Mechanic and sequence them and build a gallery and get it done as soon as I can. Um, if it's not, I'll ask somebody else if they can do it. Um, or, you know, I, it, it's just so much, it's so pared down. I mean, I walk by the stacks of the New York Times, LA Times, Washington Post <laughs> every day, and I just lust after the ability for those papers to run the pictures that you run, and thank you for that. Um, because we're not doing that. 
unless it's just like, yeah, this has got to happen. This has got to be on the front page. We are hyper local about what we put out there. Um, that said, we've been, all last week we did Olympics <laughs> on our front page every day. Uh, and every publication. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, um, but our, our newspaper has been, a year and a half ago, it was redesigned to really accommodate the philosophy of being far more local. So all of our international and national everyday stuff, it's totally in the A section and it is so small. So, um, you know, it's, it's a matter of perspective. But so me personally looking at the wires and fatigue from that, I tell you what, I'm just going to be flat out honest. I'm not looking at the wires a whole lot every day. I don't have time unless it's a huge event. And I go, okay, got to tune into this. And, um, and it's changed even from, um, you know, the nurseries, the kids shooting in, where, I'm sorry, Little Town, Littleton, Connecticut? New Town. New Town. Sorry. Um, what was that, five years ago, six years ago? Uh, it was like was three years ago, maybe. It's December. Four. It was December. It was right before Christmas, I think. You know, it was different then. I was, like, looking at the wires all the time. And I tell you, that, that one got me. Mm -hmm. That one got me good. Um, you know. I'm sure it get, got a lot of people, but um, if that were to happen today, I'd have to look at those pictures, but honestly, I don't look at stuff from Syria every day. I don't have to, and um, just to be blatantly honest, I'm okay with that. I see it on social media. I see it. And I tell you what, something happened last week that was just startling for me personally. You know. You scroll into your Facebook and your phone, and the algorithms are like bringing all this stuff in that you don't really like. Oh, really? That popped in. There were like two videos of ghastly animal abuse popped into my face, and I was like, "Oh my god!" And I, I couldn't shake them. I could not shake them from my brain. And it's like I didn't need to see that. And so I think that that's a responsibility that we have to think about. And um, I don't know the answer to that, but it just got me thinking. I'm like, I, there was a reason why I did not watch Daniel Pearl's execution. Um, I worked in St. Petersburg Times at that time, and I remember my friend and colleague, Pat, uh, Scott DeMusey, he watched it because Sue... You don't have to watch it. I'm never going to forget it. And I wish I hadn't seen it. And I, I chose not to watch it. And it's like I know that some people in our positions don't have that luxury. Um, but um, I was mad <laughs> when that stuff came onto my phone. Because it's like it startled me. I'm like, wait, what is what 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 is that? You know? And uh, so I think that we have a responsibility to people, and if it's a graphic warning, my God, put it out there. Um, yeah, it created awareness, but I already knew this stuff was happening. But it's like, oh my good lord, um, it was just, it was just horrific. So we have to help with that. I think we're in positions that we can be responsible and help people filter that stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you all Do you find that the fatigue that you're dealing with of looking at this stuff over months and years and days and, you know, um, uh, impacts the decisions that you're making when thinking about what your readership or viewers are seeing? Yeah, I think it... Go ahead, Nick. Please, please. <laughs> I don't know. I think it does. Um, yeah, I mean... Me personally, I'm also not l looking at as much wire stuff as I used to. It's kind of I do look at the wires every day, but it's all, usually now very for very specific um, stories. You know, the biggest biggest stories of the day. Um, 
Uh, but there is a lot of horrific stuff out there, and I, I definitely don't feel like I have to have those photos every day uh, in the newspaper, um, you know, or, or even online. Uh, New, the Newtown thing was one that stuck with me, and that was kind of, you know, personally one of the hardest ones to, to deal with, just looking at that. I don't know, there was something just really affecting about that, those photos um, and just that event. But I don't know, I, I guess I kind of am uh, somewhat just uh, numb to it, uh, seeing the wire photos every day, and I kind of can just feel like I can just deal with those. But again, I'm not immersed in them every day. But, but I think, you know, it does affect how you, how you choose pictures because you don't want to have your readers become numb, numb to these images. Um, you want to make a point when you want to make a point um, with intense imagery. If there's, uh, you know, for us, um, usually there has to be a really good reason to do it. And I, I want to, if there is a good reason, I want to be able to make that point and I want to be able to put that picture out there in the right context um, and not have that get lost if we're just doing that kind of thing every day, you know. So that's uh, that's definitely a big, you know, decision-making factor is how often are we doing this stuff, why are we doing this, so. Well, I, I agree. I, I, think, I think you made a good point there. Um, and, and like I said earlier, I think the, if it moves the story forward, then I think then that's uh, an important and, and reason to, to show imagery. But I think you need to be sensitive to, to what people look at. Um, as well as, you know, personally. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it's not easy looking at all this stuff all the time, but at the same time, like, you you know, you sort of do the task that's at hand and you re reflect later. And I think that that's definitely something that came to mind during uh, Orlando recently and during Paris and Brussels and all of the things that's happened this last year. Um, you just kind of buckle down and uh, reflect later, and when you have time off, you take that time off. And, uh, and I think it's sort of changed with, with social media, too. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of, during the Paris attacks, I was charged with finding images of all of the victims. Uh, and so digging through social media accounts and trying to find them before they moved on the wires, um, and it was tough, and and uh, you sort of saw all of the people's lives as they before you know they died, and you got to see their daily life. But uh, you know, when I got off of work, I did not check Facebook. You got to disconnect because all of those images that I went saw and found out, every photo editor across the world was looking for those, and then they're sitting there on your Facebook feed. Um, so I think on a personal level, you got to kind of have time to disconnect and uh, reflect. But when you're doing the job, you're doing the job. Mm -hmm. Is that something you've had to train yourself to do almost, is how to unplug a little bit? Because I can imagine when these stories come up, Sometimes. they're just you know, on your mind for a lot of the time, right? Like reading a lot of details, and you know, I I think Paris for me was was sort of what struck a chord, especially since all, all the people that were in the Bataclan were my age, and I sat and I looked through their like there was the, the set of twins. I'll never forget them. You know, I look at their uh, or sisters. I look at both of their Instagram feeds, and you'll see the things that they do, uh, and you'll see them appearing in each other's feeds, and that sort of at home for me, um, and I just had, had to remind myself you got to disconnect. And it's a, I think it's something that, that comes with the territory after doing it so much. And I haven't done this for long. I'm not a veteran. I'm fairly new to this, but uh, you, know, you do have to disconnect. Yeah, and I think it comes naturally. Like you, you know, if I, I walk into the newsroom and I am look. You know, you see the TVs and people bustling about, and you're like, okay, well, here we go again. Um, and you just kind of pop into that mode, like you know, we need to crank out a slideshow really fast. We need to, 
you know, start trying to pull together, you know, what we're going to do for print or whatever it is. But then later, you know, if you're if you're still tuned into it, you're going to want to keep reading about it or keep doing, uh, I don't know, or if you just, you, I don't know, you, I think you know when you need to disconnect and, and um, you know, you can do that. Um, it's not it's not hard to turn your your phone off or just put it away or just don't you know when you've when you've had enough and over you know consumed all of the content that you you can possibly consume I, I would think it's pretty easy to say okay we're we're done with that now and move on. Um, there are times. Yeah, I'll I'll turn the TV off in a photo area, I'm like yeah. We're done for the day, <laughs> and nobody turns it back on. <laughs> so it's like that's a sign. Um, and it's usually only me at the photo desk, so it's like I'll know about it if it happens. I don't need to have the television on. And there's enough information at your fingertips. You don't you don't need all these sensory things coming at you. Right. So that's one of the ways that I've dealt with it. It's just like nope. Don't need it. Don't need it. I don't watch the TV news at night. I do not watch unless like something big happens. I'll turn on CNN at home, but I don't watch TV news at night. I get a news alerts on my phone. Why do I watch TV news? So that's my own. That's my own outlet. <laughs> For sure. So we've got uh, a question came in um, from Wayne Thomas. Hey. My former classmate. Hi, Wayne. Um, hey, Wayne. Uh, so he, uh, and this is probably for uh, maybe Nick, you can address this. Uh, he's asking, what what's the process when you, when you find an image on social media, um, like in the case of looking for all the, the mug shots of victims, which, you know, I that's something we've done in the past. So what's the process um, when you find an image on social media that you want to use um, how do you go about doing that? Because it's obviously not the same as something pulling off the wire. Um, you're, we're, there's you know permission issues and all that kind of stuff to think about. So how do we uh, yeah how do we deal with that? It's a great question. <clears throat> it's a great question. Um, and and there are, I actually recently watched a really great uh, webinar with uh, the head of Storyful News, and, and uh, they're an agency that verifies social media videos and photos. Um, I definitely think that's a great resource. If you're really interested, you should look what there. But what? But, uh, Storyful. Storyful. Uh, Storyful. Storyful. Okay, Storyful. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's great. The, the, so, uh, they, we we actually do is they go and they'll verify uh, images based on looking at Google Maps and, and just making sure something's real. Looking at the social accounts that. Uh, of the poster to make sure a they're a real person and b that um, it's likely that they were at the place where they said they were. Uh, they look at the metadata. Um, so I I think firstly I'm I'm skeptical uh, and try to verify that a it's real uh, and b I always try to reach out to get permission uh, and a lot of the times that won't happen. So uh, sometimes we'll embed the images. And that's a way we're, we're able to use them based on the preferences of the person that shared the image that we're able to use. And we can't do that in print, but uh, for web, we do. It's a little convoluted, but. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a murky area, um, you know, trying to figure out how to use social media images. I've definitely reached out to people on Twitter before or on Facebook, like, Hey, you know, I'm with the Denver Post. I really would like to, you know, I saw this image. Would like to use it. Can we use it? Um, and just wait for people to get back to us. Um, in the case of, you know, victims of tragedies, uh, we always try to collect stuff from the families first. Um, Definitely. But you know, sometimes, uh, yeah, we will pull stuff from from Facebook. I think a rule we try and use is we'll. If we're trying to grab a mug, you know, procure a mugshot of somebody, we try and get one that's clearly a selfie. Um, if it's taken by that person, so we're not, we don't have to, 
it kind of nullifies any image rights issues of uh, other photographers. You know, if it's their photo and their uh, the deceased victim, or, or you know, if they're a, the perpetrator, it's not. There's no other image rights issue there, um, and we feel like if it, and that's only in big breaking news situations where it's like we need this image. That's kind of a guideline we'll we'll try and go with, but it's again, it's definitely a, a gray area. Trying and total case by case basis using when we're using those photos, so it's always always dicey. Yeah, and it's very much as a case by case basis, and and I, like thinking about it ethically, it, I think is very important. And uh, so we we try to make sure we contact family members first, and 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 try very hard in any other way before we turn to social media. Yeah. Um, and, and if we have to, then then we do, and we try to verify it uh, through uh, different methods, and then probably end up embedding it. So Nick, I've got a question for you. I can't that experience of finding all those pictures of relatives or the victims in Paris. Um, wow. I mean, didn't that gave you pause? That that must have been some poignant. This must have been some poignant hours you spent. I mean, because you were seeing people. They're seeing people's lives, and somehow those were the most important pictures you were going to be able to publish of them. Yes, and and to to, to me that that was the most rewarding part of the whole thing, and that was important was to remember these people, and and they were I, I think that their their stories are much more important than how the shooter got inside the theater or how they did. Y and Z, but it was to the, the tragic nature of this, the story was to you know, represent. It's like the last to represent. that was going to be published to them, perhaps, right? And that, that's mm -hmm. really, that's really, that's a huge responsibility, so my hat's off to you. That's tough. As you all are thinking about that, you know, I think, Sue, the word you said is great is responsibility and um, how we're portraying people. Um, when when you're in newsroom, has there been a culture shift in terms of um, how that workflow happens? So for Nick, you was it tasked to you, and it wasn't going to um, oh, like for example, as we're as we're pulling things off of social media, I can imagine that there's been times in all of our newsrooms that things are just sourced and pulled and dropped, right, without being as you brought up, accurately checked on location and time and thoughtfulness in terms of how we're portraying the story and things like that, um, in terms of being able to share the story as quickly as possible. Like, the motives are good, but the execution may not have been there. Um, has that shifted for you all in your newsrooms in terms of that? Like, Nick, was this your responsibility that was tasked to you um, so that you could find that balance in terms of how you're selecting images? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a task to me, but uh, one thing that, you know, in, at the end of the day, we are the Washington Post, and uh, to remember that we have to be right first, no matter what. Uh, and uh, if we're late, then we're late, but we have to be right. Um, and it's a big responsibility, uh, and especially dealing in situations where people have died, and my biggest nightmare would be to pull an image of someone I thought was someone else, and they're actually alive. That's oh, man. would be awful. So you have to be right. Um, so and that's why I, I'm at very thankful that in our newsroom they allowed me to be involved in this situation. That we have enough staff that my daily responsibilities I was able to ask another photo editor to handle while I was able to really spend the time to verify uh, that these images were respectful and, and correct. Mm. Yep. Yeah, it's always always an issue making sure we're right. I mean, yeah, we don't want to ever publish something that's just an egregious error of judgment. Um, there was just popped in my head when we were um, the Dallas Dallas shooting when of uh, the police officers mm -hmm. when that happened. Um, we were. I don't know, a reporter came over and we, we thought we had a mugshot of the 
um, victim or of the of the shooter, and uh, he thought he remembered seeing that guy at a um, Trump rally, uh, or a, yeah, at like an anti-Trump rally um, a few couple weeks earlier. Um, or even the week before, and so we, there was this fury of activity trying to find photos of this guy, and we were like, "Oh man, we think this might be might be the guy." And then finally, one of our photographers came up with, "No, I talked to this guy. It's not him." Um, but you know, had we just immediately, "Oh wow, that yeah, that's that guy," you know, and published it, we would have looked like huge idiots, and um, and uh, that would have been a terrible lapse of judgment. But you know, we. Don't jump on those things immediately. We, you know, like, well, let's check, let's wait, let's verify this. So um, that is always, always the best option. You know, whether it's, uh, you know, pulling a local file photo you, you know, that you want to use, or if it's pulling something off social, it's always same idea. Our um, workflow is um, fragile. <laughs> Shall I say? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, things move fast and furious, and <laughs> there's not a day that goes by. I'm like, where in the heck did that come from? It says Twitter down below, and I'm like, oh my god. But then I look it up, and it's like, oh, it's a dot gov. I'm like, okay, fire people, give it out. Okay, fine. The Boston uh, Marathon bombing. Do you guys remember when um, the fo the first boat, you know, when they found the guy in the boat in the backyard, right? And there was a picture that ran on social media, and it looked like they had him down on the ground after they got him out of the boat, and it was like it ran on Twitter. We had a one of our designers, he was the first to see it on Twitter, and I think it was late on a Saturday night or something. And he goes, "Oh my God!" And he like put it on the page before he talked to me. And I'm like, "No, we don't know anything." <laughs> and it's and it's like, "Oh my God!" We can't verify just because it's there doesn't mean it it's real. We didn't even know where it came from or. Yeah, so it's a very fragile situation, day in and day out. We've had something that has helped a little bit, but we have to repeat ourselves often. We had our attorney come in and talk to the whole newsroom about uh, how this could get us into a lot of trouble, not just for um, our reputations are about being correct, but, you know, Copyright, lawsuits, yada yada. You know, it's like I'm constantly trying to tell people this stuff. They don't want to hear yeah. it, but it yeah, it's, it's, that is the daily challenge. <laughs> Probably, yeah. It's there. Yeah, it's there. We, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same battle with uh, you know producers want to just you know they want to be fast, they want to be first, and they want to have a photo on every story. Because you know it's going to get shared better, as we all know. Everything uh, that has a photo on it is going to get looked at more than something that doesn't. Uh, but we have to remember that there's not always going to be a photo, and we can't um, we can't verify it. We don't know where it came from. We can't just use it. So that's a constant, constant what battle. I want to be right. <laughs> yeah. I want to be right the first time. You know, <laughs> it's important. It's critical, and in, and it's super challenging in in this day and age with social media. If you look at uh, recently in, in Turkey, the the attack in the airport, mm -hmm. um, people, there are Twitter accounts that'll put out images and say they're 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 from that attack, but actually, in fact, they're from the Brussels Brussels attack that was months <laughs> months earlier. And uh, same thing with victims. You know, people will put out images and say. This guy's my brother. He's missing, and it's actually not really the case. Uh, and uh, people want to pull those images. And as photo editors, we have to be very cautious and careful, and try to tell our colleagues that we have to be right. And photos are journalism; that they are just as important as sourcing your 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 words. 
do you all, as we're coming to the end of our hour, we usually try to keep these as an, at an hour, um, partially because of you all, really, we're thankful so much for the time that you've given us. Um, is there any advice that you have for um, photographers and photo editors out there who are trying to have these conversations in their newsroom or trying to keep their heads on straight as they're having these conversations every day and looking at these images every day? And that's from everything from the sensitive imagery that we've been talking about to you know, political coverage, we're all overwhelmed with political coverage and making sure things are accurate and how we're covering things there. Um, any advice that you all have for um, students or photographers or photo editors watching trying to have these conversations in their own workplaces? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in first. Um, I would say whenever possible, don't just do a knee-jerk reaction. Give yourself time to think about it and ask some really critical questions like what do I know, what don't I know, and how do I get those answers, and who will this, what will this decision, how will this decision affect people that are going to see this, how is it relevant to my readership and my community, what is my community. I think there's a lot of questions that you have to, you have to tick through on an ethical and a sensitivity issue a level to answer those questions, but give yourself time. And these decisions do not happen in a vacuum. Never feel like you're alone in them. You might not agree with other people, but you've got to hear everybody out. You've got to walk it around the room. You've got to listen. You know, sometimes the best thing to do is to shut up and listen. And um, you'll learn a lot by that. But try to just take a breath and not wrapped up into it. Keep it in perspective and context. Um, and the more you do it, the better you will get at it. Yeah, I would, I would say the same thing. The, the conversation thing is, is really important. And even though, you know, your title is photo editor um, and, you know, you are, are, are the one who is specifically tasked with, with finding the photo and, and vetting it, but it's yeah, at the end of the day, it isn't just you. It's it's a, a conversation depending on, you know, if it's online, you're working with the web producer to, to pull that story together. You're working with the page designer to do it, you know, and the other editors at the paper. So it, it should never be your only sole responsibility to uh, make a decision uh, on a photo and lis listen to other perspectives and... Um, you know, be willing to compromise when people make good points and then be willing uh, to stand by your decisions and your, your points when you've heard the arguments and you um, need to stand firm. So it's always a conversation. I, I agree. It's a, it's a very collaborative. It, it needs to be a collaborative process for it to be successful. Um, and I think you most importantly, you need to ask yourself what the ethical ramifications are of the decision you're making. Uh, and if you're unsure, then you really need to talk, with, talk it out and talk with people and, and uh, hear other people's perspectives, as you, you both have said so well. All right. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our hour that you've all been so incredibly kind to give to us at the end of your work days to talk more about photos after you've spent all day looking at photos and talking photos. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, these hangouts really uh, serve a purpose uh, in terms of making people feel like we're a community, that even if you're working by yourself in your newsroom or your staff has been cut in your newsroom, that there's other people out there working through these issues too. And so we hope that you find these helpful. Um, they are archived at APhotomanager.com if you'd like to share them or you're tuning in now but want to hear the beginning of the conversation, um, please catch up with us later and you can go back and view other ones. We have some other great ones coming up in the upcoming months from social media and talking about how uh, we work on the different platforms of social media to some of the current events that newsrooms have been covering around the country um, to workflow um, in newsrooms and getting photos online. Um, so I want to say thank you so much to Sue Morrow from Sacramento Bee, Nick Kirkpatrick from Washington Post, and Pat Trailer um, from the Denver Post um, for giving us an hour out of your day to 
to talk about these things with us. We really appreciate it. A pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. No, thank you so much. And it's always awkward to hang up, but uh, <laughs> especially when we could probably keep talking about this for a whole nother hour without <laughs> even an issue. Um, and if you'd like to hear more and talk with some of these folks, uh, please consider coming to our conference September 11th through 14th. It'll be a great time to be in the same room together um, and uh, uh, be around each other talking about these types of things. So uh, thank you again. Thanks, right. guys. Good to see you. Right. Have a good night. Cheers. Bye, everybody. Thank good night. you. Good night. Good night.